Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, this evening's presentation. And this presentation is part of the series on Reimagine Nova Scotia. And so I want to start by saying thank you so much for ev to everybody who's here and who made the time this evening to be with us. I really, really appreciate that. We all appreciate that. And I can promise you that this is going to be a really, really interesting discussion this evening. Um, first, I, I, I want to acknowledge that we are on uh, the unceded ter territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And um, I want to, to just acknowledge that before we get anything else going here. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit about this series. And so, Reimagine Nova Scotia is a project that started in the Faculty of Management at Dalhousie University and under the direction of Dean Kim Brooks. And so I just want to acknowledge as well how thankful we are for Dean Brooks's uh, leadership in this regard. We started to talk a few months ago about how um, Nova Scotia, like everybody else in the world and every other jurisdiction in the world, is going to have to adjust to new realities going forward with respect to the pandemic and with respect to rebuilding after the pandemic. And so we started to talk about, um, you know, what does that kind of rebuilding look like? And it's not just economic rebuilding, which is obviously extremely important and important to a bunch of other outcomes too, but it's also about, you know, what, what kind of society do we want to build after this? And what kind of things do we want, do we know weren't going great before this? And what do we want to try to fix? What do we want to build back better to kind of borrow a phrase that others have used? And so uh, Kim and I and a, and a number of people got together and sat down and thought, okay, how can we contribute to this conversation? And so what we did was kind of break down the conversation into five working groups. And so each of these, these panel presentations in, as part of the Reimagined series is really about a different facet of that that research, that knowledge, that kind of bringing things together. And so the, the, I think the real strength of the project is that we're not only drawing on the particularly, you know, fantastic resources at Dalhousie in terms of our, our professors and our researchers and who is around the table at Dalhousie, but also we're making connections in the community where we're working with practitioners, we're working with government leaders, private sector leaders, and so around each topic that we talk about, we're, we're bringing together a table of people who don't always talk to each other, right? Like we're bringing together a kind of cluster where people are bouncing ideas off of each other that don't always intersect. And so we're hoping that from that, we get some really neat ideas about how to move forward. And I think the, the, the kind of thrust of the project is a shared ownership around how to build back in a way that's really good for Nova Scotia and is better than we had before. And you know, one thing about crisis is that it does create an opportunity for rebuilding. And so for us, not only are we dealing with the pandemic, but we're also dealing with um, the aftermath of and the, the reality of the largest mass shooting in Canadian history. Like other jurisdictions, we are dealing with the legacies of colonialism, racism. We're dealing with all that at the same time. And so I think at this point, we really need to be thinking together as a community about how we move forward. And we need you know, all around buy-in and, and, and engagement around how that kind of blueprint looks for us. And so that's to give you a sense of tone and purpose of the project, that's where we're at for that. And so I'm really, really happy that everybody is here with us this evening to be able to share that. And so we're very, very excited tonight to have the panel that we have around, and the theme tonight is support and protect. And so um, without taking up too much more of your time, I'm going to introduce you to your speakers for this evening. And so for the speakers tonight, we have Andalina Ifton, we have Sheila Wilderman, and we have Martha Painter. And so I will give you a bit more of a background on each of the speakers before they, they come up to us this evening. But for right now, I'd like to turn things over to Andalina. Adelina, sorry to give you a sense of how tonight is going to play out. And so I don't think I told you this already. My name is Lori Turnbull. I am the director of the School of Public Administration at Dalhousie. And I'm really, really pleased to be your moderator for this evening. And Again, so happy that you joined us. So, Adelina, please. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Lori, for moderating. Uh, we are, um, the three of us are going to try and provide a bit of an overview of um, our cluster's report and an overview of um, uh, our findings and recommendations. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, 
explaining the work that our cluster did and provide some of the general themes that we have focused on and some of the um, sort of uh, core broader uh, findings that we we have reached. And then um, Sheila and Martha are going to uh, provide uh, uh, some concrete examples of the areas that we found were um, not particularly well addressed or had uh, good innovative um, uh, responses as they relate to a protective and uh, supportive services. So the project uh, basically is focused on an inquiry into the Nova Scotia's responses to the three overlapping crises, the pandemic, the mass shooting, and the police brutality, especially in light of the um, of the um, of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, events that really tested not only the individual resilience, but also the government's commitment to uh, support and protect all of its residents. And for this report, we draw upon the experience of, um, of a very interdisciplinary group of experts, including lawyers, librarians, uh, social workers, health professionals, academics, and community organizers. And we also interviews various, various stakeholders, including uh, societies that work with criminalized individuals, indigenous support organizations and experts, civil societies that provide education and community support for those in need, and others. And as we, as we work together, we identify that there are six core issues uh, that relate to the Nova Scotia responses uh, in um, responses from the protection and support uh, perspective. And those were the access to resources and access to safe spaces during the crisis, um, the access to online communication and technology. And these are the two that I'm going to, uh, to get into a bit of details uh, tonight. Um, the other four include the police and incarceration, dysfunctional regulatory bodies and court systems, um, the trifecta of support, including housing, income assistance, and access to healthcare, and child protection and child care. And these last four, uh, Martha and Sheila will uh, be addressing. However, the common thread, so they are a lot and they do cover a lot of territory, but the common thread um, for all of these, uh, these areas is that the barriers and the solutions to the problems um, and in these areas had a really disproportionate impact on marginalized individuals. Um, and when we talked about marginalized uh, individuals, we're, we, we talk about uh, people who are homeless, people living in poverty, people with mental disabilities or mental health problems, people who are elderly, people who are incarcerated or recently released, uh, people in long-term care, women, trans and non-binary folk, indigenous and black individuals and communities, as well as people who are experiencing violence. Um, so a few observations regarding the, the access to resources and um, the access to technology. Um, I think one of the things that we've remarked on and uh, came uh, across the board in all of these areas was the fact that while the Nova Scotia has shut down in order to prevent uh, or to what we thought is going to be um, to uh, improve the chances of resisting an outbreak and to uh, protect the public health care, what actually happened was that a lot of the groups and a lot of the communities uh, suffered disproportionately from these shutdowns. Uh, for instance, uh, the, safe the, the safe spaces were closed in, as a response to the pandemic, while these safe spaces um, were crucial for victims of domestic violence that were now locked up together with their abusers, were crucial for youth at risk um, and other marginalized individuals, uh, people that uh, live with intellectual and development disabilities or people who have mental illnesses ended up being isolated, separated from the groups and individuals that normally provide them with support. Um, and this, uh, this resulted in many individuals falling into crisis. So it led to another kind of public health crisis. Um, even though it wasn't directly created by the pandemic, it was created by the responses to the pandemic. Um, we've also noted that the importance, the importance of deconstructing the siloing uh, of services in favor of wraparound uh, uh, services, and um, this has existed prior to the pandemic, but has become obvious during the pandemic. Um, the siloing has contributed to a division of resources and has been a barrier to finding innovative solutions for very complex problems that cannot be solved by one 
organization or one department. And for instance, even in the cases where, for instance, resources were available and the organizations did uh, receive resources to um, like food and, and other supports um, uh, for the, um, to provide their, the individuals that they are helping, um, the problem was that they did not have access to these individuals or there were logistical challenges in identifying how best to uh, allocate the resources. Um, at the same time, there were organizations that we talked to uh, that whose problem was not resource allocation, but their problems were the lack of resources altogether. So what we saw was an unequal distribution of resources among organizations. And perhaps unsurprisingly, but non, not, uh, nonetheless particularly tragic, was the fact that indigenous organizations were the ones that received the least amount of resources. For instance, the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center, who's serving um, a lot of the indigenous individuals in the urban center, in the uh, uh, urban centers, um, was mentioning that they uh, they had to fight uh, significantly for all the funding that they have received, and they received very very little funding uh, in the end. So there was a general uh, feeling of significant dissatisfaction and a sense of unfairness related to the fact that indigenous organizations were not able to decide how to distribute the funding that they did get, and they did not get competitive funding with other organizations. And it is unfortunate because this is a typical colonial response to indigenous groups' needs, and it is deeply incompatible with uh, uh, the goals of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission report and its recommendations. Um, from the perspective of the communications and the perspective of technology, uh, a lot of the services and a lot of the supports that existed during and that were providing were provided during the shutdown were made available and were made known to the public through technology. So everything came uh, to, to be advertised online um, without consideration for those who do not have access to online resources or have very little um, online literacy skills or simply do not speak English. And um, these updates really reproduced ableism as they did not include sign language, plain language, or other disability accessible forms. And also on, in this area, another issue had to do with the fact that um, uh, children and youth were expected to learn from home with the assumption that they had the technology, they had the internet access, they had the skills and the cognitive capacity to engage online. Um, and this plan unfortunately alienated individuals that are already alienated, such as African Nova Scotian youth who already face systemic barriers in their education, indigenous students who lost access to their school-based advisors. Um, they were concerned about supports made available for students with disabilities and the success of their implementation, and also students who did not speak English, especially those for, uh, refugees and other, um, other immigrants, uh, were completely left out of this education plan during the first wave of the pandemic. So um, there are lots of concrete recommendations that we made on the side of resources and the unequal distribution of resources during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, but, um, and I can talk about that in the Q&A, but I just want to note that really the core of those recommendations had to do with the importance of collaboration uh, between the provincial government and various organizations and stakeholders when designing these intervention matters in order to ensure the equitable access to resources. And we also noted that inequitable access to resources is really not a pandemic problem. Rather, the pandemic had simply uh, widened the equity gaps that already existed. And um, it is really important to address disparity and lack of access outside the pandemic as well, so that the responses in time of crisis can go smoother and uh, avoid disproportionate uh, impact on marginalized individuals. So I'm gonna have to, uh, to um, end here, but I welcome any questions that you may have. Adelina, thank you so much for that. That was that was a really, really interesting uh, opening to the panel and to the topic for this evening. And so I really want to want to thank you for that. And I would just want to tell the audience as well that Adelina Lift Ifton is uh, the assistant director of the Health Law Institute at Dalhousie and a professor at the Schulich School of Law. I'm going to introduce next uh, Sheila Wildman is an assistant professor in the Schulich School of Law. And so I'm going to turn this over to Sheila right now and very, very thankful that we've got her insights tonight. Thank you. 
I'm an associate professor, but it's not really a big difference in the hierarchy of professors. Uh, I've, I've been asked to address the topic of police and incarceration, as well as regulatory bodies and court systems, uh, as we you know, reflect on and share a bit from our process and our report, the question, the framing question of which was, what have we learned from the pandemic, mass shootings and police brutality that can change how we access resources, safety and justice? So I wanna start um, with process. So you've heard that our process uh, drew together a diverse set of experts, um, diverse set of experiences. Um, and that's so important to start with that framing question of process. Uh, so just a comment on that first. The framing of who is needed around the table as we define the problems and identify solutions is so important. Sometimes it feels like an infinite regress as you have to talk process and representation before you even get to you know, the letter A and the ABCs of social justice. But that is the foundation for the whole alphabet and questions like whose alphabet and whose social justice? These are questions that Nova Scotia has grappled with up close in the wake of the mass shootings in Porta Peak as we fought over how the inquiry should be constituted and who should populate it. And more recently, we in Nova Scotia have seen another fight around process. Again, not just the how, but the who, and who's there to weigh in on the how. <clears throat> this has reemerged with great force as the decade of people of African descent coalition has publicly challenged the legitimacy of a process that was recently announced by government to inquire into and propose solutions to systemic discrimination in Nova Scotia's justice system. So squarely at the center of the topic we were asked to address. That announcement, the province's announcement and apology for systemic discrimination in Nova Scotia's justice system. Um, so says the critique came without consultation with a set of indisputable leaders in uh, Afri the African Nova Scotian community and in the movement for reclaiming and reframing justice in a way that reflects the priorities and the histories of those communities. So that's process and I'm only clearing my throat because I'm supposed to talk about police and incarceration and regulation and courts. So let's get to the substance. How about police? Today in my class, we talked uh, about an essay that I'll recommend to you, um, and I can give more information afterwards. It's called, Are Police Obsolete? Breaking Cycles of Violence Through Abolition Democracy. The paper takes its cue from a landmark book by uh, Angela Davis called, Are Prisons Obsolete? And there she articulates a conception of prison abolition that's grounded in the thesis that prisons express and cement racial and gender and class, and I'll add disability, injustice. That prisons mask problems of deep inequality and the violence of oppressive and corrosive social power with ideologies of just deserts and protection from violence. These were cues that we took in our report and in the work that we did. This was once prison abolition, abolition democracy, defunding police, it was once a fringe idea and now it's practically breakfast news and that is something worth reflecting on. In the wake of COVID-19, in the wake of the mass resistance and global resistance that we've seen to colonialist and racist and ableist, ableist police violence and killings, um, we've seen an explosion of thinking and imagination around these concepts, abolishing police, abolishing prisons, what does it mean to defund the police is a question that has come up in many circles. So what did our report say? Uh, it reflected the spirit of our times. Again, in the wake of a global explosion of mass resistance with Black and Indigenous Lives Matter, uh, resistance to ableist and racist and colonialist police violence, including in the context of so-called wellness checks. We said this, here's a simple quote from our report. Police are often asked to respond to health and social crises, which endangers lives and further stigmatizes racialized people and those with mental illnesses, intellectual disabilities, and addictions. So it's a fairly simple statement. We draw on the example of ticketing for non-compliance with public health regulations and the way this disproportionately has punished and responsibilized individuals uh, where mental health problems or homelessness or other challenges are at the root ca causes of non-compliance. 
We contrast the vastness of police budgets with the relative dearth of training and infrastructure to support community first responders in libraries, schools, hospitals, and other settings, including through training of peers and allies in de-escalation and anti-racist and anti-ableist praxis. Yet we also saw signs of hope on this and other topics during the pandemic response, starting with police again. Community organizations with whom we consulted reported that police had increased communications and reliance on them to help find shelter and supports for people with mental health issues facing criminalization, rather than arrest them and place them in police lockup and potentially jail. Turning to decarceration, and this is perhaps the most striking of the stories of which I'm aware uh, around Nova Scotia's pandemic response. So in Nova Scotia, we saw an unprecedented coordination of justice authorities, corrections, legal aid, the public prosecution service, and the, and the courts, all, as our former deputy minister of justice often said in this period, all rowing together to a common end, which was decarceration. As a result, 50% or nearly 50% of Nova Scotia's provincially incarcerated population was released in about a two week period. And that's a population we know is primarily composed of persons awaiting trial. As a result of this and other measures, only one provincially incarcerated person tested positive for COVID-19 in Nova Scotia in comparison to jurisdictions like the federal jurisdiction, which did not engage in comparable decarceration efforts and saw infection rates uh, 13 times higher than in the community. So that's a big story for Nova Scotia. Still, as Martha will relay, the bigger story was the fleeting commitment to ensuring that health, housing, and income supports were available for those released in order to stick a wedge in that revolving door that so many of the most marginalized in our communities spend their lives in, passing in and out of prison, psychiatric hospital, and a range of precarious and dangerous environments that poverty and criminalization condemns them to. So our report draws together the story of radical decarceration of provincial jails with the parallel heartbreaking story of failure to decarcerate our brothers and sisters with intellectual and mental health disabilities. So we know that well over 90% of COVID related deaths in Nova Scotia occurred in long-term care. Yet throughout the COVID response, congregate living set settings uh, for persons, specifically persons with intellectual and mental health disabilities were cast in the double shadow of the primary focus on hospitals, as well as the secondary and emergent, absolutely important, critically important focus on long-term care and on jails. So that's something we reflect on as well in our report. Um, last, turning to regulatory and court systems. Our report made note of how regulatory systems and court systems responded to the pandemic. Some of these examples were also positive. For instance, the decarceration efforts that I just noted suggest new possibilities for justice, health, and community services regulatory silos to be broken down in recognition that complex systems of oppression and injustice need a multidimensional response. But in other examples, regulatory systems, including adjudicative systems essential to protecting basic rights, uh, such as in the example of criminal trials indefinitely postponed, failed. And this has affected, uh, in particular, criminalized persons who are disproportionately indigenous and racialized, and some of whom are still in jail awaiting trial. So in sum, uh, I'll just sum up, you know, this is a moment that should cause us to reflect hard when we tell ourselves or others that transformative social justice is impossible, that people can't change and systems can't change. But how that change happens, whether it happens, is up to us. Back to you, Lori, and I look forward to questions. Sheila, thank you so very much for that presentation. That that really does a lot to inform the discussion tonight, and we're very, very grateful for that. I would like to invite our third panelist, Martha Painter, to come forward, and she is a doctoral candidate here at Dalhousie in the nursing program. And Martha, we're very, very pleased to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much for what you're going to share with us. Thanks for having me. I'm 
here to talk about how universally for someone to be safe in our society, they need at minimum housing, a livable income and health care. This trifecta of support that we identified should be a collective responsibility and something that we as a public ensure for each other. The pandemic made these three needs greater than ever. And those who faced the greatest pressure in these areas were people who already experienced racism, poverty, and oppression. COVID-19 presented a line in the sand kind of opportunity to abolish these neoliberal norms that drive inequity and guarantee a public commitment to everyone's survival. That did not happen yet. We did see some ethical, responsible, hopeful initiatives, but they were stopped too early or didn't go far enough. For example, while there was a ban on evictions in Nova Scotia for the first three months of the pandemic, it was not broad enough or long enough. If you were already unstably housed and precariously employed, um, COVID wasn't a new threat to your safety, to your stability. And so the protection didn't apply to you. People with disabilities, Black and Indigenous communities are grossly overrepresented among the poor and unstably housed in this province. Furthermore, the ban ran out early in the summer. Another example of hope that got dashed. What was called the JEC, Jack Initiative, between J. John Howard, E. Elizabeth Fry, and Coverdale Court Work Society, so C. They received funding for community-based placements, including hotel rooms, for over 35 people released from jail. So the decarceration work that Sheila was describing. Decarceration reduced the risk for them, for the jail staff, and the community around the jail, right here, us, from the very real risk of a COVID prison outbreak. Ashley Avery, Coverdale's executive director, stated that the initiative in total cost 11,000 a month. This is a far cry from the cost of incarceration in this province, which is over 6,000 per month per person or 210,000 per month for those 35 people. Another example, we saw the federal government implement CERB speedily, easily, and widely, showing we don't need the bureaucracies and challenges we have long had in place restricting access to social assistance. Social assistance is a provincial program. And here in Nova Scotia, it's about $500 a month for a person without disabilities, 800 for a person with disabilities. CERB set at 2000 a month demonstrates how grossly inadequate income assistance is. And that grossly inadequate rate was only topped up once in the spring. A whole other team um, as part of the Reimagine initiative examined healthcare and that last uh, element of the trifecta of support. So even though I am a nurse and I worked full time during the pandemic, I won't get into that much, except to say that the pandemic showed just how much energy and investment we can put into prevention of harm and illness when we want to. If we can do universal COVID testing and treatment, if we can instantly invest 110 million into COVID research, we can afford universal pharmacare, universal home care, dental, eyes. Furthermore, in the context of an infectious disease pandemic, when we rely so much on each other's actions to stay healthy, we see how critical it is to forcefully shift structural determinants of health to end poverty, to end discrimination, because we all benefit from keeping, keeping each other well. Another universal need is for childcare and protecting children from poverty. Nova Scotia has the highest rate of child poverty in Atlantic Canada, one of the highest in the country, and rates are unchanged from nearly 30 years ago. We aren't prioritizing the lives of our kids. 
While sending everyone back home in March intended to keep people safe, it was not met with consideration for the lack of resources, food, and childcare that children may be going home to, let alone their caregiver's potential lack of homeschool teaching ability and equipment. Despite extensive acknowledgement around the world that COVID has increased domestic violence, family regulation agencies in Nova Scotia, so called by some child protection, called by others, family policing, moved their work online or to telephone proceedings. And in so doing, they effectively cut off the parents under their surveillance who are disproportionately marginalized, racialized and indigenous women from access to their children. They couldn't visit their kids. The long-term trauma from this cannot be underestimated. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child stipulates the child's right to be parented, to be in school, and that all states have a responsibility to create policy in the best interest of the child, not that ignores it. Instead of investing in police forces and carceral regimes to enforce pandemic restrictions, the province should be investing in universal services that promote equity and well being, like housing, income healthcare, childcare, and school. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martha. That, that was a really, really great addition to the, the conversation this evening. And I'm really, really pleased that everybody has made the contributions that they've made. This has been such a far reaching conversation. And I think we're hitting a lot of the issues that have been raised as a result of, of the kind of light that this pandemic has shone on different issues in the province. And I think, you know, the real goal of this project is, is not only to talk about um, policy issues, but also to figure out how we can situate ourselves to do much better work going forward. And so I think that the conversation that we're having tonight is really important because it's hitting on these issues. And it's also hitting on the ways in which they intersect with one another. We're not dealing with things as silos, as you know, kind of concrete compartmentalizations, but we're dealing with things in ways that we can see how different policy issues affect each other. And so I think that we're getting into the complexity of it, which is great. And so Adelina, I would, I'm gonna pass this to you to wrap up before we get to the question and answer portion of the night. Right. So just uh, just a few ideas regarding uh, regarding what we've seen and regarding where we're going um, as it comes out of our report. So basically, we we tried we concluded uh, by noting the fact that uh, you know as as you would have heard from both Sheila and Martha, there was some positive innovations and there were some positive responses that really are able to show us how much we could achieve if we actually worked uh, more together, if uh, more voices were included in the conversation, if we relied less on reactive institutions like prisons and police, and if we invested more in community supports. And ultimately, the pandemic is also an opportunity that shows us that had we had stronger structures in the first place, had we had smaller equity gaps or no gaps at all, the pandemic would not have been the challenge that it has, nor would have other crises been. So the responses to the pandemic were reactive responses. Um, the hard work that has to be done has to be done outside of times of crisis to create better social uh, equity and better um, uh, social justice. Because overall, what we saw during the pandemic, uh, we have saw uh, forces that are actually within those pre-existing gaps. And we saw that those responses are actually responses that are tailored for the white middle class male Nova Scotian um, who speaks English and who has the resources to uh, properly, who has a safe home, who has the, the necessary um, resources to uh, feed himself during the pandemic. And really these responses illustrate that structural discrimination continues to exist at all levels of the society. And um, we are completely unprepared for crisis when that hits without actually further hurting those that are already vulnerable. I'm gonna just um, stop there and welcome any questions. 
Okay, that's great. Thank you. And so we are going to welcome all of our panelists back into the stage right now so that we're able to open up questions to the audience and have all of our panelists be accessible to answer those questions because obviously we have quite a bit of expertise tonight that we'd like to cut into some issues before it's time to close. And so just to give the audience a little bit of an opportunity to, to log their questions and things like that, I'm gonna pose one of my own. And so um, first I'd like to thank all of the panelists for their very, very thoughtful presentations tonight because I realize we're dealing with very interesting and complex and, and uh, you know, deep, deeply cutting issues here. And so I'm really, really impressed with and, and thankful for the contributions that have been made tonight, not only by the panelists, but also by the people who have contributed to the report that these panelists are, being, are bringing forward to us tonight. I'd like to ask the panelists about the issue of the universal basic income. And so that came up in the report that was brought forward by this group. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on the concept of the universal basic income, the feasibility of that concept, and you know whether that's something that we could pro possibly imagine working here in Nova Scotia and what the social outcome of that would be. And so I'd really, really be interested and appreciative of the comments on that. While there are um, obvious benefits to securing a universal basic income for everyone, my concern with that approach would be that we need to continue to invest in public services. And so we don't want to create a situation where we're relying on um, people's um, whatever the delegated amount might be. And again, they're having to choose between um, scarce, use that scarce resource to choose between necessary services, right? We all have rights to a lot of things and it's our responsibility to make sure that those are secured. Right. I, as, as Martha was saying, the universal basic income is not a panacea, right? It's not something that is uh, solving all the social problems, just like CERB did not solve uh, a lot of the problems, right? I do think that uh, if properly created, the universal basic income would actually uh, could go a long way in solving some of the some of the inequalities that exist. And um, I think that uh, the CERB has been, you know, a really good experiment in terms that it, in fact, it is possible. It is possible actually uh, overnight to do that. So if there is a political will, there is the money to do that for sure. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, um, there are various projects right now that are working on uh, documenting the impact, the potential impact of a universal basic income on the various aspects of society. Um, I've looked at it more from the criminal justice point of view, but a lot of we know, of course, that uh, poverty is one of the very big driven of uh, drivers of criminalization and a lot of individuals are criminalized for um, actually uh, for their poverty, their mental health problems, for a lot of things that actually don't have much to do with criminal law at all. So uh, probably, you know, a universal basic income would be an important step in the direction of uh, you know, helping individuals uh, pre or prevent uh, these reactive responses that we see from the side of the police and the prisons and whatnot. But as Marta said, you know, uh, that would have to come together with investing in our other uh, services and our other resources that uh, are out there, including supports for employment of individuals, supports uh, for, um, for health care, supports for housing, for everything like that. Uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, multi-layered approach that uh, it's possible. We saw that it's possible and uh, it's essential. It's essential in preventing uh, the problems and the disasters that we've seen during the first wave. I would just add very quickly a, a follow-up because I agree with everything that, that was said. Um, I think that the approach we've taken in this report reflects um, an endorsement of shifting from you know, criminalization and obviously incarceration as a response to a whole range of social problems to more of what we could call a public health approach and an approach focused on social determinants of health, which happen to also be the social determinants of decriminalization and decarceration. Um, and, uh, and so I think that a basic income and uh, policies like housing first are uh, definitely um, starters 
in that work of uh, shifting to a public health approach. But I also just want to bring out, and add to what folks said, the importance of continuing to pay attention to the growth sort of population-wide inequalities that we can see across populations. So throwing sort of a, a singular solution to the population as a whole um, is not going to redress uh, some of the deep um, kind of corrosive impacts that have been experienced disproportionately by some communities. And I think that the, the, the point that I'll sort of cap off with is the one I started with, that the process of redressing those deep corrosive inequalities is something that has to look to communities themselves, whether we're talking about uh, racialized communities, indigenous communities, obviously, um, and also persons with disability, persons with experience of domestic violence and the rest. It's, it's a lot more complex, obviously, than, than, uh, than a basic income, but it's a great place to start. Okay, thank you so much for every, everybody for, for um, speaking to that question. I'm going to start to move over to the questions from the audience now, and I'm so grateful that we have such fantastic questions from the audience, and so I'm gonna start with this one. Could Professor uh, Wildman kindly, kindly expand on what abolition democracy means and where we can read more about it? Fantastic. Oh, that's great. Well, and it gives me a chance to refer to a couple of my favorite papers. Uh, whereas Allegra McLeod's paper is the first that I'll mention, which is often cited in the work on abolition democracy and, and what she calls an ab abolitionist ethic. Uh, and it's called Prison Abolition and Grounded Justice. It's a 2015 paper in the UCLA Law Review. And if people are interested, they can find me easily online. You can find me and I can send you that reference. But the one that I was talking about, um, about uh, in reference to uh, police defunding called Are Police Obsolete? It's written by a couple people, uh, Noel Gimbel and Craig Mohammed, and it's very recent. It's just this year, Card uh, last year, Cardozo Law Review. And one of the things that I find so interesting about it is that the two writers are, the one is, it looks like a law student, you know, JD student in, from the States. And Craig Mohammed, the second author, is someone who's been incarcerated for over 36 years. And the two of them teamed up and wrote a 100 page paper. If you're interested in more on, you know, abolition democracy, uh, they've written a paper that gives lots of examples, concrete examples on what it means to take measures that, that would start down this, this road of, um, not the road is a long road as we imagine abolition democracy in the sense that yes we can start now by taking concrete initiatives that promote decarceration that promote a public health approach rather than a criminalization and punishing approach to the sorts of social problems that we've been discussing but abolition itself is not about uh at least as i understand it and i'd welcome other others um perspectives it's not about suddenly you know, closing the doors, not making a sudden shift for which nobody, you know, is kind of prepared. It's preparing the ground with concrete initiatives that um, help shift from uh, the, what we've called, you know, neoliberal um, individualizing, responsibilizing approach to social problems to something that gets to the roots of those problems. So I'll just leave it there. If, if others might want to add something to that. Okay, um, un unless somebody jumps over me, which I'm, f I'm fine with, but in the interest of time, I might just kind of jump on to the next question um, from Paul Menard. Has there been any progress or discussion with judges or and Crown attorneys choosing alternatives to incarceration using the relative success of reduced incarceration during this pandemic response as a lesson or a trial? Great question. Wow, that's a good question. One of the issues with this is that it, it starts with policing, right? So even though, and, and we've heard this all through the pandemic, the jails do not want people inside. It puts them at risk, right? So, um, and the... <sighs> The issue starts with policing. So if we are going to move forward with efforts to defund and decrease policing, then we will have fewer people experiencing criminalization and fewer people at risk of incarceration. 
Yeah, so I, that's the starting piece. Oh, sorry, Sheila, go. No, no, you go ahead. I thought you had just finished. Please keep, keep. No, no, I'm good. Really? Yeah. Well, I just pick up from the policing because the next point for us to think about, and then I'd, I'd be interested in Natalina's comment, is pre-trial incarceration. So that, like like we all recognize around this table here in Nova Scotia, it was about 60% of the provincially incarcerated folks were incarcerated pre-trial. And I do think that the renewed, the, the, the um, forceful attention to the law on pretrial incarceration and bail, which is the law says that it should be absolutely a last resort. Pretrial yeah. incarceration should be a last resort. And the placement of conditions on folks, pretrial conditions that often as, you know, BC Civil Liberties and others have, have pointed out, um, often set people up to fail to breach those conditions, like don't drink alcohol and you're a person who's dependent on alcohol, you know, and the rest, you breach the conditions, you're in jail. These are patterns we've recognized for years. But I think that that COVID and that moment of rapid decarceration using uh, bail as one of the primary mechanisms is something that has reinvigorated that knowledge because it is simply, you know, it's 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 a legal fact <laughs> that, that pre-trial incarceration should be a last resort and conditions should be only imposed where they're necessary. And if we just get that straight, we will um, manage to decrease the population of our provincial uh, jails, I think significantly. But Adelina, you're the crim law expert. So I should see what you think about that. Um, well, just to respond very like, um, you know, from a like pra practically or uh, the immediate response to Paul's question, is that I don't think that there have been um, systematic discussions between judges and crown attorneys, unfortunately. Um, so there wasn't like there were, you know, a symposium in which people talked and decided, you know, oh, it would be really a good idea to start thinking about something else now. But what we have seen is that um, the conditions the pandemic has been considered somewhat regularly in bail decisions by judges. So there have been a lot of judges that in deciding against um, uh, remand or against pretrial custody and for allowing the individuals in the community, they considered the conditions in prison, including the pandemic, to be one of those factors. So that was a good thing. Now, it's unfortunate that they had to consider that, given that, as Sheila mentioned, you know, um, uh, the, you know, the starting, the presumption should be that that the individual will be released on awaiting trial without any conditions. So it is sad that it had to be a pandemic to be considered so that the number of individuals um, that are released on bail increases. But we also saw a whole bunch of decisions, uh, bail decisions, in which the judge said that the pandemic is not relevant and that um, we even saw a decision in September where a judge was mentioning that actually the individual is safer in prison than in the community. Mm -hmm. So the bail decision have been Canada-wide all over the place. So I would mm -hmm. definitely don't consider that to be a consensus. Um, in terms of Crown attorneys, I do not know if that made them ask for less time or not. Um, so I really cannot talk to, the, uh, to, to that issue. Um, and as for sentencing themselves, um, I don't think it had a great impact, unfortunately. But of course, uh, the courts have been shut down for a few months uh, during the pandemic. So sentences have slowed down. Uh, but that's not, unfortunately, because, you know, uh, charges have been dropped. It's just there are further delays. And we have to see that there's a connection too between when people are not, um, when they're being remanded and that remand decision is because there's nowhere safe for them to be housed. This uh, delusion that um, it's safe, but actually when our society doesn't make any investments in stable housing for people, then that um, kind of absurd position becomes more rational, right? I'm just, I was just waiting for a minute to get, uh, make sure that and Adelina was unfrozen because I, <laughs> I, yeah, make sure I everybody think was I, here. I think everybody's I think good now. I'm sorry. No, no, all good. All good. Um, so a, another question, can you give a concrete example or examples of what it means to defund the police apart from just reducing police budgets? Okay, I've got a couple on that since I was talking about police. Um, 
there's three ways that three broad ways that I think we can uh, attack this this problem, and it starts with decriminalization. So it starts with decriminalizing uh, behaviors that currently are criminalized rather than treated with a public health approach. And the best example of that is possession and use of drugs. Uh, so I think we can go even further than decriminalization in that example and, um, and look to uh, ways of implementing a safe supply of drugs, which means offering uh, alternatives, a regulated alternative to the current toxic supply and poisoned supply of drugs that uh, folks are uh, desperately, you know, enforced to rely on. <clears throat> so that's number one, and that that that's a, an approach that could redress not only the staggering rates of overdose deaths that we are, see in our communities and across the country, but also responds to the incarceration, disproportionate incarceration of folks uh, with a range of uh, health problems, including substance dependency. So decriminalization would be my first answer. Uh, that's Dila, like, can I just yeah. add one yeah. thing to that? Yeah. The yeah. other thing that it addresses is this family regulation system and how many families are broken apart and mothers taken from their children, children taken from their parents, criminalization of drug use. Yeah. Oh, so Back important. To you. The knock-on effects, which re reach so deep into communities. And um, uh, when we were talking about corrosive impact, that that family ripple effect out into community is so important when we're thinking about what happens when somebody's incarcerated. Uh, and the second would be very related, you know, taking a public health approach, I said this sort of already, so an approach looking at social determinants of health and how to enable equitable access to those through housing, income, uh, and health supports uh, as, a, as an alternative to investing in policing is the other thing where we, we often go, and as we pointed out in our report, we were focused on uh, community and peer supports for people in mental health crisis. That's one form of investment one could uh, take. Uh, another form is you know working with folks who are incarcerated or have been susceptible to incarceration on things like exiting gangs or you know gang violence uh, contexts. Um, programs that reach out to street involved youth in order to redress, you know, violent ways of um, solving problems in communities. So there's a whole range of public health approaches that paper that I mentioned goes through some of them. And the last one goes to different sort of pathways to repairing broken or damaged uh, relationships. And, you know, restorative justice is one um, pathway that has received a lot of attention, restorative as opposed to punitive um, forms of justice doing. Transformative justice is something that gets, has been picked up more in the literature and in the grassroots politics of resistance to policing and incarceration. And the fundamental thing that means, as I understand it, and I'll just look at Mimi Kim, Kim's uh, definition of that, and then I will be quiet. She says, transformative justice solutions tend to lie within marginalized communities and more radical social movement spaces outside of institutions. So it's kind of kept drawing on the knowledge internal to communities themselves uh, as to you know what the problems are and what the starting points are for solving those problems, including problems that now are uh, responded to with a, a policing and a carceral response. Okay, um, I think we are going to do one more question. Um, just looking at what's on the screen now, we have a comment from viewer Janine Verge about some of the barriers that deaf and hard of hearing people face. Are there any recommendations that you have focusing on this particular community? I think this is one of those um, many examples where we have to look at uh, who gets to count as the public and whether we are making adequate and appropriate investments in public resources so that everyone can be included in the discussion and participate in democratic um, life, right? And so that means that we have to be prioritizing services that allow everybody to participate. We need to be thinking all the time about um, language, uh, about um, hearing, about ability, right? And this this uh, just has to be um, 
uh, routinized and across the board made part of our thinking as we develop policy and programs and as we make decisions about what we are going to uh, spend our public funds on. Um, so I really appreciate this question because it, it really gets at um, our values and um, whether we wanna be a society that values everybody. Right, and, and a lot of our recommendations, the more our recommendations are sort of uh, separated based on more concrete, immediate recommendations and the ones that are longer term, like a lot of the issues that have to do with evolution and the funding, some of them are uh, more concrete and quite frankly, easy to implement and creating platforms and online resources that are disability friendly, regardless of, you know, the type of disability and actually provide support for everyone, as well as using simple language or including translation to multiple languages. This should not be rocket science. That is something that's needed. You would think that by now, people creating these kind of services know that already, right? Um, so it's kind of shocking that we didn't see them already. Um, and also, um, it, it's sad to say, but it might be that there is actually a need for consultation with all of these stakeholders to see if these kind of platforms that they are proposed are actually accessible to everyone uh, that uh, that uses them. So um, they have fallen short on so, so many levels. And, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the type of platforms used uh, is something that can be very concretely and very immediately implemented and rectified. I, I just want to go back to the idea of going to community to, um, to learn around what kind of measures would be responsive. And my example, although that, that example about the deaf community is so important, so that would be the place to start, right? In terms of what's not working, what might work. Uh, my experiences with folks with intellectual disabilities and plain language communication, including around COVID um, regimes, which was a real problem during, uh, during the pandemic as we first faced it. And one of the innovations that has come forward out of Nova Scotia Association for Community Living and a group called People First, which are self-advocates with intellectual disabilities, um, is drawing on that community to do plain language editing. And this should be paid employment. That's that's a key piece of, of it, is uh, you know, to use um, folks, uh, their knowledge and expertise in that area to actually increase the um, accessibility of all com public communications, but starting with COVID, I suppose. Okay, um, thank you so much for that. So we just have one last last one that I'm gonna throw at you guys and then we will close this out. Um, Sheila says, I would be interested in hearing how the police in Halifax have responded to the concept of defunding the police. What are they saying in response to this? I think Martha is one of our best situated friends. <laughs> well, I mean, nobody's surprised, but they're not keen on it. And what we have to be very careful about whenever um, we're hearing about what uh, our calls for change in relation to policing, the first question you have to ask is, does this change involve more investment in police, right? So police will say, oh, we need body cams or, oh, we need training or, oh, we need more resources so that we can do this better. And that's never the answer, right? So um, that's the, the, the critical question to bring to um, all of these discussions about how we move forward with defunding uh, police. Okay, so I think at this point, I'm, I'm gonna draw this particular panel to a close with, with significant enthusiastic thanks for everybody who contributed tonight. Thank you so very much. This has been such a wonderful opportunity to learn more about these issues. And I really, really appreciate the fact that you all made the time to do this tonight. And I, and I am going to go out on a limb here and think that you are, are all going to be uh, open to people contacting you to discuss your research, because I think this is just a fantastic opportunity for people to get to know more about what you do. And obviously you have such, such a, a pivotal contribution to make to the conversation about what life in Nova Scotia should look like. And I'm so pleased that we had the opportunity tonight to give focus to that. It's extremely important. So thank you. Thank all the panelists very, very much for that. Uh, and please accept my thanks on behalf, behalf of everybody who's listening tonight. Um, 
I'd also like, since I'm in the in the zone right now, I would also like to thank uh, Lori Bald and Barrett and Nicole and everybody who are behind the scenes right now making this thing work. Um, we also have wonderful interpreters who are, are making this work as well. And so I just want to extend that appreciation because we wouldn't be able to do this if it weren't for that. And the only reason that we're able to make this work at all is because people are actually making that stuff happen behind the scenes. And I want to express you know, unlimited appreciation for that. And I think that this, it's so important to get this stuff out to the community. And so I think, you know, we really have to express that, that appreciation there. Um, same time, same place. Next week, we have uh, the third panel as part of the reimagined series. And the focus next week is on learn and work. And so please tune in with us. You will hear from Andrew Rauch Chaplin, uh, Diane Myers and Bruce McDougall and me. So thank you so, so very much for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Have a fantastic night and a fantastic week. Throw on that presidential debate tonight if you've got the stomach for it, and we will see you very, very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all.